when we think of diversity in the United States, we usually think about gender diversity or racial diversity. So are women represented at an institution? Um, how many black people are at an institution or Latinos? Uh, how many immigrants are there? Rarely, though, do we think about class. So we don't think as much about people's economic backgrounds and the influence that has on their life chances. We usually think of inequality as happening because there's a resource, like access to education, and there are moats or fences built around that resource, so not everybody has access to them. One of the things that we see is that elite educational institutions, like Harvard, have become more accessible, not less accessible, yet they are playing an intimate role in how inequality is reproduced in America. Elites aren't sort of the big middle of society. Instead, they're the kind of tiny tail. A lot of the traditional uh, techniques that we use to access and analyze populations don't work out as well when we're talking about the elite. How do you get access to somebody like Bill Gates? Chances are he's not going to answer your survey. And this is true for lots of elite people. So what I decided to do was to do an ethnography, which means that instead of gathering statistical data about elites, I would go and live with and spend a lot of time with elites. This involved packing up my life, moving to an elite school, and chronicling the day-to-day -day life of this institution. The school I studied was St. Paul's School. It's a small boarding school in Concord, New Hampshire. I also attended this school. Today it costs around $50,000 to attend this, and it's a high school, so you can imagine that's an astronomical amount of money. When I was a student there, the most common college students went to was Harvard. More students went to Harvard than any other college, and the next uh, most common college was Yale, followed by colleges like Brown, Stanford, uh, most of the Ivy League. So this is a place that really positions students for future advantages in their lives. I said to St. Paul's, I'm interested in studying the elite. And at a place like St. Paul's, elite is not a bad word. It's actually a good word. So the institution understands itself as an elite educational institution meaning that it has a responsibility to train the next generation of leaders in ways that are moral and responsible. So our current Secretary of State, uh, John Kerry, went to St. Paul's. He lived there with the current director of our FBI, Robert Mueller. They also lived with Ed Pillsbury, the heir to the Pillsbury fortune, and Gary Trudeau, the cartoonist who draws Doonesbury, which is partially named after Pillsbury. This should give you sort of a small sense of just how central this tiny school is to the American elite. The tools of an ethnographer are to go into a place and understand its day-to-day -day life. At the end of a day, I often would go home and I would start writing down what happened during the day. And I do this every day, day after day, to try and provide a kind of account of the life of the school. These notes are called field notes and they serve as the basis of data for an ethnographer. So ultimately what I was really interested in was how students made sense of their lives and their lives as present elites and future elites. And it's important to remember that not all of the students at elite schools are presently elites. Some of them come from disadvantaged backgrounds. And I was interested in how these different groups of students experienced being at an elite school, how they understood their place there, because chances are they're going to be in fairly significant positions of power in the future. The main finding that I had from my time at St. Paul's was that students cease to think of themselves as a class. Instead, they think of themselves as individuals who are like everyone else, just harder working and more talented. The reason that students are successful is because they have real talents. And the reason that they advance in life is a combination of this talent and this hard work. And that idea is really central to what students learn at a place like St. Paul's. St. Paul's represents a broader set of institutions or a broader set of schools that really mark almost every community in America. Across all the 50 states, there are private schools where people who come from advantaged backgrounds are able to invest more money in their children's education than the average American can. By doing this, they effectively buy advantages for their children and help perpetuate systems of inequality. There's massive public subsidies that go to supporting elite private schools. The public subsidies are with student loans. The subsidies are with grants, where the universities take 62%. The subsidies are with uh, tax policy, where these institutions don't have to pay any tax on anything that they consume. And so thinking of these institutions as 
private institutions really obscures the ways in which they live off massive public investment. The subsidies that we're giving to these elite private schools through tax policies, we might be able to justify them if they were providing opportunities to people who didn't have them before. But instead, what we find is that these elite educational institutions are engines of inequality. So one of the things that we might ask ourselves is, is this a good spending of our resources? Is it worthwhile giving a tax incentive to an institution that has nearly a billion dollars in an endowment and only 500 students? And so the way in which I think about elite private education is not so much that we should ban elite private education as that we should think about the kinds of investments that could be made in public education such that all students in America could have the kinds of educational opportunities that are afforded to students at St. Paul's.